I will not compromise. We're unwinding from a crazy thought system. And hallelujah. Thank God that we're allowing this lifetime to be used for that purpose. And perhaps we've allowed other lifetimes to be used to wind ourselves in <laughs> a little bit deeper. <laughs> Now we're going, okay, reverse! <laughs> kind of like a ship or a submarine where the captain or the admiral goes, stop! All stop! And then, reverse! <laughs> We've heard Captain Kirk and Captain Janeway and John Luke Picard give that order. <laughs> reverse! <laughs> Let's get out of here! <laughs> this is not friendly. <laughs> we want to go in the other direction. We want to go inward inward to the love in our hearts. That's the direction we're going. And what was coming to me today to talk a little bit about is that um, a metaphor from this world, what the world calls addictions, addictions in this world can be quite intense, not often recognized for what they are. Some of them are more talked about socially, like drugs and so forth. Um, and then there's addictions that we feel like um, we just keep coming back to and coming back to. Uh, some of you might have saw the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? And in that movie, the, an addiction is defined very, very simply as uh, something that you cannot stop. You know, so it's, you could say in this world it would be like a, a behavior pattern that whether it's taking drugs or any number of forms, but it's, it's something that you cannot stop. You, you feel, it feel like you've lost control, voluntary control over it, and you repeat it over and over and over. Even if it has destructive aspects and seems to wreak havoc on your life, it's called an addiction because it seems like, you know, there's great difficulty in stopping it. And people do succeed in transcending them. So we could say ultimately that, that if addiction is something you cannot stop, that eventually when you do stop, you can go, okay, that's good. <laughs> I kicked it. Kicked the habit. How many people here in this particular lifetime have gone through an experience of an addiction and that you were able to literally to transcend? Okay. There's a lot of hands. And then, what was helpful in that? I mean, obviously, uh, addictions can seem to be, for those of you who have gone through that, they can be very, very intense. You talk about nail-biting, white-knuckling, cold turkey, uh, all kinds of aspects of help and support that are so helpful. What have you felt, if I mention the words help and support in terms of those addictions, what what was it that seemed to be the most helpful thing in turning it around and transcending it? Being uh, gentle with myself. Being gentle with yourself. Okay. Anybody else? Not judging yourself. Not, not judging yourself. To Are bring you? up and release the underlying beliefs and feelings of unworthiness, shame, guilt, and massive self hatred Okay. Very important. Getting at what's underneath and releasing what's underneath the seeming behavior pattern. Um, having a reason to quit more than I wanted to think. Okay. Motivation. Reason to quit more than to keep the addiction. Okay. Well, I just uh, read the course and it was saying that you didn't have to change your behavior and so I didn't feel like I had to do something <coughs> different and so it was easy to follow him and I just I found that meditation in the presence of God was, you know, a better high than that. So okay. Meditation in the presence of God. Higher power. I think I've heard that word in 12-step programs. Yeah. Well, complete surrender. Just totally giving up. Okay. It's just a surrender. Like, almost like a kind of down on your knees, like, yeah. I give up. It's over. It fits in with the, the yeah, presence. I need help. Yeah. Joining with a sponsor who I knew loved me. Joining with a sponsor who I knew loved me. There we come with a support idea. Mm -hmm. So essential. When the temptation to go back gets so strong that you can make a call, go visit somebody. Yes? Um, a transcendent moment. You can see around all the time. Transcendent moment. Like a glimpse where you just yeah. totally pierce it. Yeah. 
And then you go, whoa. Yeah. To join with a sponsor following the glimpse. Okay. Talk about a one-two punch. The glimpse <laughs> and the sponsor for ongoing support. And, you know, I bring this up because I would have to say that when we're working with A Course in Miracles, one time when I asked the Holy Spirit and Jesus about addiction, Jesus told me, well, really, deep down, the only addiction you have is judgment. The judgment was not something that God created you to do. So you're trying to do something that is very unnatural, and it's very uh, debilitating. It's devastating, actually. It, it keeps your mind out of peace of mind instead of in its natural state of peace of mind. That the Course teaches us that judgment arose, judgment was a device that arose after the separation. So this is a mechanism that the ego has developed as a defense mechanism. What, what, how would that work? Why would we buy hook, line, and sinker a device like judgment, except that maybe when in the Kingdom of Heaven where everything was bliss and love and oneness, and when we seem to have an experience of something other than that bliss, love, and oneness, that it was chaos. Absolute, stark, raving, madness, chaos. And judgment, which is ordering of thoughts, you know, just like if you were a a uh, kindergarten teacher, and you walked into your kindergarten room after you spent 45 minutes away and there was no supervision, and then we walk into the kindergarten room and it's a food fight. And I mean, not just a minor food fight, they've got cases and cases of jello pudding and mustard and old things that were for the picnic, and they're, they're smearing it on each other's faces, on the clothes and everything. I mean, look, imagine you walk in the room and it's a major food fight. It's been going on for 30 minutes. And it's all over the walls, and it's stripping from the ceiling, and it's stripping from the nostrils and ears, and, and every, all kinds of orifices. And you're in there, and you go, whoa, and then you go, stop! You blow your whistle, or you do something, you say, okay, all of you, all the girls over here, all the boys over here, get away from the food, step away from the food. So you see, you would try to bring order into the chaos by judging, and categorizing, and trying to, you know, bring some control into what seemed to be a very chaotic situation. And this is what the ego said, ah, oh, you feel chaotic, mm hmm ah, oh, you should, it says, you've, you've separated from your source, N naughty, naughty, you, God's really upset, he's not going to like this, you just decided to rip your mind away from God, you feel chaotic, ah, oh, no surprise, I can help you, here, I, little pretty one, I can help you, here's some judgment, and this will help minimize the chaos. It will help bring a sense of order into stark, raving madness chaos. And so we took the bait. We took the lollipops. You know, we, we, we said, okay. And then we've had this judgment addiction going on. And really that's what made linear time, and that's what perpetuates the illusion of linear time. When eternity is really all that there is, the judgment, we took on the device that was made by the ego, and we thought it would help solve our problem. And what? It's just designed to perpetuate the problem. We took on a device that was designed to perpetuate the ego's illusory existence and illusory world. And now we feel like when we look, when we grow up, we go through education. What is education except a curriculum and judgment? Think about it. Could you learn anything in any of the disciplines without categorization, comparison, differences, judgment. It's a, we've learned, hook, line, and sicker, a, a curriculum in judgment. And now, you could say we're addicted to it. We've been addicted to it, and it's not just for a couple weeks or a couple months. We're talking about millennium. This goes way back. This goes, this judgment's been going on before the earth was formed. It's, it's an ancient, Device. It's been going on for a long time because time is part of the device and all of history is, is part of it. It's in cahoots with the ego. Now, we just talked about addiction and transcending addiction with the glimpse, which we call in Course in Miracles the Holy Instant, all and on the Holy Instant, and then this continuing support, which in the Course it's your mighty companions. You shall not go on alone from here. Mighty companions go with you. You know, these are symbols that still of your own mind. <coughs> symbols that the Holy Spirit is using to help bring you back 
with a sense of support, just like a sponsor, a trusted sponsor who's been through it before and transcended it and can offer wisdom and advice and support. What do you think Jesus is? He went through the same thing. He had to go through the same trials and temptations like a sponsor does and then comes out the other end and is a source of wisdom and support. So, for me when I started working with the Course in 1986, I didn't know about Course Groups, I didn't know about, you know, call, there was no online support, you know, mentors and all these things that we have now. It was just, it was just me and the book, a paperback book, a single volume paperback book. So I just dove into it, was highlighting it, things, reading it, as I said, eight hours a day for the first two and a half years, and developing a direct connection with the teacher of the Course, with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus, because I felt like the most important thing for me to do with the Course was to develop a link with my internal teacher, that that would guide me on far better than a book. In fact, the book could be stolen, burned, taken away, and if I had that internal link with my internal teacher, it wouldn't mind. It wouldn't matter at all. If the, and when the copyright controversy came up and people were saying, you know, we got to defend the Course, I said, I'm not defending the Course. I'm, I'm working on my link with my internal teacher, which says, judge not, seek not to change the world. If I defend myself, I'm attacked. You know, I'm practicing my link with my internal source because that's the most important thing to me. So after... A, a, a few years, I could hear Jesus, it was like a train of thought that was coming directly from Jesus, so I had that link with the internal teacher after about three years with the Course. And it was great, it just made life so simple. Go here, go there, call this person, go visit this person, here's what we're going to do today, today we're going to meditate. You know, it was just like, like having a little bird on your shoulder that's just telling you everything that you ever could need or wouldn't he? Very, very important because I followed the Course so deeply that I actually got to the later parts of the text, the self versus self-concept section we were talking about, which was basically salvation is nothing more than escape from concepts. The Course wasn't teaching me to retain concepts, it was actually telling me that I would have to release them and escape them. And I thought, boy this sounds a lot like the Buddha this sounds like a lot, like all these authentic spiritualities that I've been reading, all these non-dualistic spiritualities, which are saying, empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know. Hold on to nothing. Some of you remember that passage from Lesson 189. Simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of which you're concerned, all, all concerns about the body, and it goes on to say, hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought to pass this thought or one belief you ever learned before from any, anyone. Forget this world, forget this course, and hum, come with holy empty hands unto your God. To me, I, that just, my heart chords went. The same when I read it through Buddha or any other great teacher, I read it the same thing. It was like, wow, he's saying, do not hold on to anything of this world if you want to know eternal peace. And that's the same teaching, interesting, had a, Huxley talked about the perennial wisdom. That's the perennial wisdom of non-duality teachings. <coughs> let go of everything. Now the Course also said some interesting things. He said, you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. That's pretty uncompromising. That's like saying, you may benefit from studying this Course. And he also says, you know, is it important to 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 believe in Jesus, and he says, well, you know, you can, you don't have to, but if you call upon him, he can be of help to you. And that's a beautiful thing, too, for us. It's kind of like, that's a nice option, to know that Jesus is there. If you call upon him, he can be there for you. He can guide you. But also the Course is really teaching us, actually, that you, you do have to actually go through an experience of allowing those concepts and beliefs and roles up into awareness and seeing them for what they are, guilt and, and pain and suffering, and then actually releasing them. So if you thought that you could just study the Course and learn the Course like you learn any other book, then you're in for a shock. Because the curriculum of the Course 
is actually not experienced or reached through words. And that could be kind of like, oh, come on, there's over 1,200 pages and you're saying you cannot reach the truth through words. But if you read the words, that's exactly what the words say. Truth cannot be des described or explained, but only experienced. In fact, Jesus actually calls words, words are but symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. Hmm. That's an interesting thing to think about. If you think you're going to reach God through reading the Course and studying the Course, just think about that one. That words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Would you want to rely on that to reach God? Something that's twice removed from reality? Ooh! <laughs> Doesn't sound very like a very safe way to get back to God if you're relying on something that's twice removed from reality. Then you get into the workbook and he says things like, we but use words today to start the practice. And he actually sends us into wordless meditation. That some people have said, who are Course in Miracles students and teachers, gee, the Course is, is a great path, but David, can you give me any instruction on like meditation? I said, the workbook is instruction on meditation. Maybe you should go back and look exactly what it's teaching in there. It's actually taking you right down into be still and know that I'm God. It's taking you right down into that stillness. He's using words like that. Today we sink beneath the thoughts, you know, to the kingdom of heaven within. He just, he, he is so direct. And anybody who thinks that A Course in Miracles does not involve meditation should actually do the workbook and really give themselves over to it and see how still your mind becomes when you really give yourself over to the tool that was designed by Jesus Christ himself for meditation. It's the best, you know, people talk to me about TM, postures, lotus position, this and this. Come on, this is a time saver. People talk to me about mantras, and Jesus even mentions chanting in the, in the uh, workbook. He says, today we lay, aside, we lay aside our charms and chants. Lay aside! What does Jesus think about chanting? <laughs> lay it aside and go down deep in your mind to the truth. If you go through that workbook, you're going to undo most of the stuff you believe about spirituality and most of the stuff the world believes about spirituality. You can forget about trying to make some kind of synthetic religion you're going to borrow a little bit from Buddhism, a little bit from Hinduism, a little bit from Islam, a little bit from the Quran, a little bit from the Sufis, and make some kind of a synthetic mix, you know, a synthetic blend, like, you know, herbal tea with honey. You know, it ain't going to work. He's saying, lay aside your charms and your chants and bits of magic, he calls them. That's what he calls chants. Bits of magic. And yet how many ashrams spend how many hours a day chanting, chanting, chanting? We're telling you this is the sacred word of God. This is the sacred name of God. Chant this 400,000 times. You know? It sounds pretty cool if it's the sacred name of God. You might try it, you know? Four, that's all it takes? I'm on it. I can get that done in a few weeks. Make it back to God. I should be home to God in a few weeks. If I just do these chants. Hail Marys. Hail Mary. Mother. You know, it's like, you see, this is Catholicism. It's with a lot of things. But here we have the Master himself who's designed a workbook and said, here, practice it. So I hear from the facilitators that there's a lot of guilt coming up in the expression sessions. There's a lot of deep unworthiness. The roots run very deep. And all I would say is, that a lot of us here have had what Jeff's talking about. We've had that glimpse. And we do need that support, very much. We, do, we need that, like a sponsor, we need people around us that are reflections of this love, and remind us, and remind us, and remind us again and again. And also, that's why it's important to have a deep awareness of the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles. Because if you're going to do the workbook, he says that the text, will basically make the workbook lessons more meaningful. So the tool is the workbook. That's your workbook for going into the experience. But the text just makes the workbook more meaningful. If you don't really have a f firm, clear, grounded, 
fundamental baseline of, of understanding those metaphysics, then the workbook will be less meaningful for you, for you and less effective. It would be like, it would be like having a chainsaw to cut down a tree, and you're going, wow, a big chainsaw. We'll say 40 inches long, you know, big chainsaw. And, and your task is to cut down this big tree, and you've got gas, and you've got the oil for it, you've got everything, you can pull it, and you're like all set, and then they say, well, just one thing, you, you just have to take the blade off. <laughs> you still can use the chainsaw, the motor, the whole thing, but one thing is, here's the tree, and you have to take the blade off. That's like having A Course in Miracles going, I don't want to read the text. I don't want to read the text. No, it's too big, too long, 31 chapters, 1,200 pages. I need to do nothing. <laughs> I have one with God. Uh, and what else can the text teach me, you know? It's like, that's it. It's all this ego stuff in there, and talking about blood that shines like rubies, or blood like rubies, and tears that shine like diamonds. I don't need to read about sepulchers, and death, and the sick chapters about attraction to pain, attraction to death, you know, attraction to guilt. Those are three subsections in the text. People go, I don't, I don't need to read that. In fact, they'll even read other books, which is much lighter. There's a course in marigolds. <laughs> uh, there is, really, if, if you you want your course teaching light, A Course in Marigolds is actually a book. I've heard other ones, I think Mary Perron had one, Course of, course of Love, there's J.M., there's Ma Way of Mastery, there's, oh, there's bunches of them, you know, there's, there's this and this. I've heard some that come out and they go, this is, this transcends the course, you know, and it's, it's a much shorter book. Imagine people, hell, I'm just going to read the... The book that transcends the course. Why should I read the course? It's 1,200 some pages. I want the quick, straight shot, so I'm going to read the little cliff notes. <laughs> you know? And all I can say is the whole point of, of the course and that text is to help you get such a clear grasp of the metaphysics that you can actually then use the workbook. It's like your chainsaw with teeth, with lots of teeth. Cut right down into the bottom of the ego with that great text in that great workbook. And then even a manual for teachers, which says, yeah, you may think you're father, mother, sister, brother, or you're an electrician, or a construction worker, or a nurse, or a doctor, or whatever, but actually try this one on for a little while, miracle worker, teacher of God, just a temporary concept, but it might fit a little more loosely on you than some of the other ones. You know, once you start to practice this course, you're going to have some vast glimpses, like Jeff was talking about, vast experiences, and you may feel less like father, mother, sister, brother, electrician, doctor, lawyer, and everything. You may really start to feel like you're being used, like St. Francis's prayer, like, <coughs> make me an instrument. And maybe miracle worker and teacher of God fits in uh, pretty good. Or maybe even Course in Miracles student. You know, a lot of us have used that one for years, and we've used it very appropriately. Because it's a very deep teaching. And it's very appropriate to be a student of something so deep as you're going into it. It's wise not to just jump into being a teacher when, when you're just beginning to grasp some of the principles and you're just beginning to put some of those into practice, then maybe you can just let the old teacher role go for a while and say, I'm happy to be a student of such a deep teaching. So you see, it's step by step by step by step. Now I'll tell you, having gone into the, the Course, and I and tuning in with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that I was actually told that only Jesus and the Holy Spirit can show the meaning of the curriculum of the Course to the student. So we have to think about that. Only Jesus and the Holy Spirit can show the meaning, can reveal. We've heard the word revelation. Only the Holy Spirit and Jesus can reveal the meaning of the Course to the student. Why is that? It's because when you've transcended time and space, that's when you can reveal. You can't reveal as a student, and you can't even reveal as a teacher while you're teaching what you would learn. Because why? Because Jesus says God's teachers are not perfect, or they would not be here. And so they come to teach perfection over 
and over and over. When he puts three overs in a sentence, he means over. <laughs> I mean, really, think about it. If Jesus Christ puts three overs in one sentence, he means over. He's like, I'm serious. I'm, I'm very sincere. God's teachers are not perfect, and so they come to teach perfection over and over and over until they've learned it. So, so don't go looking for physical teachers to reveal to you the meaning of the Course. It's going to be that inner Christ light. It's going to be the inner light of the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way that you will experience the curriculum of the Course. You will not experience it through the words. The words are like a trampoline that you're going to go, like a little kid, boing, 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 and then fly. <laughs> you're going to fly off that trampoline and you're going to soar up into heights of happiness and revelation and light experiences that the Holy Spirit and Jesus reveal to you. So I'm just giving it to you straight. Don't think that you're going to find Jesus teaching in Australia uh, or find Jesus teaching in Europe or the United States or something like this. We're talking about the Christ light is the revealer of the curriculum. So you, weren't, you won't learn the curriculum, I'll tell you this, in the United States in Europe or Australia or Iceland or anywhere in the South Pole, you're not going to learn the curriculum in this world from a physical teacher in a particular place. Isn't that great? Forget about this holy people and holy teachers and holy pilgrimages and all this and this. You can get over that stuff right now because I'm telling you the truth, it's only the Christ light and only the Holy Spirit that will reveal the curriculum of the Course in Miracles. So, you know, just give it to you straight. The other thing is, we just read, and I was telling you about from the self versus self concept section, that salvation is nothing more than escape from concepts. So when we have all these deep discussions about looking at your roles and your concepts that you're identified with in mind, we're not just doing this because it might work. We're saying, oh, this is a pathway to God by emptying your mind of all those false identifications with what you believed you were in this world. Why? Because guilt is being generated from those false associations. And when you feel guilty, you feel unworthy. And when you feel a deep sense of unworthiness, the ego is in your mind, the, pr the, the uh, warden of the prison, and the ego is smiling. And the ego is just saying, gotcha. Go ahead and read that course book. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do, but if you will just maintain a false self-concept, I can keep generating this guilt and keep you just as trapped as you've always been. And you can call yourself a course student, the ego doesn't mind that at all. It's like, go ahead, if you want to call yourself a course teacher. Go ahead, the ego says. If you want to have a Course in Miracles career and have lots of followers and sell lots of books and do lots of workshops and be famous and travel all over the world and do all these things, the ego says, go ahead. The ego loves it. Because why? Because salvation is simply the escape from concepts. And as long as you retain identification with any concepts of this world that the ego generated, the ego's got the guilt hook stuck into your side, and it's riveted in there. And you can squirm, you know, like a fish who's on the line. You can squirm all you want, the ego says, but as long as I've got that big hook in your fish mouth, then you can squirm all you want, but you're not getting off the line, you know. And you can squirm, the ego says, even until you die. And what does the Course say? The ego will pursue you beyond the grave. You, that's how vicious the ego is. It's not going to stop when you're dead. It's coming after you with more lifetimes of pain and suffering. It's got more suffering in store as long as you're in this hook. So that's why we're talking about raising these concepts that you believed in. Oh, but I want to be a good mother. Oh, I want to be a good father. Oh, but I want to be a good brother, a good sister. I want to be a good worker. I want to be a good citizen. I want to be a good Course in Miracles student. Oh, there's one. Oh, I could have even beliefs of how many hours I have to read per day and how perfect I have to do the workbook lessons. The ego likes when you form a concept and you can't fulfill the requirements because more guilt. Aha! Uh -huh. 
You didn't. I want to be a good Course in Miracles student. <laughs> How good is good enough? Except, the Holy Spirit would say, peace of mind. Oh yeah, that's the goal. The goal is not to be a good Course in Miracles student. The goal is not to be a Course in Miracles teacher. The goal is to have peace of mind. And to be used by the Holy Spirit in a way that dissolves away these false concepts and false identifications that were made to take the place of Christ. Now, the other thing is, the Course, is, it says, is, is a Course in Self-Study. And it's kind of interesting because when I go around, I travel around, sometimes I hop into Barnes & Noble or I hop into bookstores, and it's always fascinating to find what category the Course has been placed yeah. in. <laughs> like when I go over to the Self-Help, I go, ah, oh, this, this is not a Self-Help book. Self-help, self-improvement. Boy, somebody's in for a rude awakening if they plunk down 30-some dollars for self-help and they read this book. They'll be like, damn, my small self seems to be diminishing <laughs> instead of improving here. I wanted a better self. Uh, we were talking with Suzanne today and uh, we were talking about the session that uh, Jason Francis did last night, and she was hearing how deep it was and uncompromising, and Suzanne's like, yeah, 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 tell it straight, give it to them straight, if anybody's afraid of this, then tough, they're, they're afraid, we're going for this, we're going for the light, you know, she was all fired up about non-compromise, about tell it like it is, give it to them straight, you're just strengthening it in your own awareness, and, and she was saying, I can't even compromise anymore. She said, I used to go to these gatherings where David would talk, and I would help set up the gathering, and I would kind of sit over there with my shoulders down going, I hope he doesn't bring, oh, there he goes, and I hope he doesn't say, oh, he said it, and, and <laughs> I hope he doesn't say that because he could offend them, and she, oh, there it goes, so she was like, set the gathering up for me, and then just sit there and go like this, and then after three or four or five of these jerky, jerky, herky, jerky experiences, like, I hope he doesn't say it, oh, he, did, he said it again. Uh, she started to go, hmm, I like it. I like non-compromising truth. I like it. Then she started to show up just to hear me say <laughs> those things, because she was drawn to it. And that's what happens when we start working with the Course. First we resist it, and then at some point, you know, we cross a threshold. And we go, I like it. I want this experience that this is leading me to. You know, I am seeing that resistance is futile. <laughs> as, as the Star Trek that episode, the Borg say. And then you start to flip over to the other side and you go, ooh, take me up in the tractor beam. I want this experience. But you can also see that you have to really question every value that you hold it's not just about saying, well, I'm going to practice the Course, and I can practice it anywhere, which you can. It's, it's great to have a spirituality where you can practice anywhere. You don't have to be in the Holy Cave, or with the Holy Master, at the Holy Feet, and all this other stuff, at the Holy Water. You can just practice it anywhere you want. But then, you start to say, well, I like it, I can practice it anywhere, and I could, you know, be doing anything and be practicing, that's true. But then there will be teachers of the Course that will come along and say, you know, really it's just a mental process of forgiveness, so just keep your life pretty much the way it is, live a normal life, and just keep practicing the Course. Whether it's going to study groups for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and keep practicing, keep your profession, keep your family, keep everything exactly the way it is, keep the status quo just the way it is, and practice the Course, and that's you're doing a good job for Jesus. Good job for Jesus. One thing about this normal approach and about the, using the idea that the form doesn't have to change, it's only the mind that has to change, is the ego loves that. The ego can use that just as easily as the Holy Spirit to keep you stuck in a false thought system by saying, I can keep everything in form just the way it is and I don't, all I have to do is change my mind. In fact, it's been fun for me to travel for 20-some years around the world in all the United States, 49 out of the 50 United States, 
I would go around to course groups, and I go around one, and I go do the circuit. And I'm there's always a few people that show up in the crowd that are like, well, I'm studying the course, and this is my teacher, and he says just to be normal and practice the course every day, and so on and so forth. And here's my issues. I've got a horrific family life, a terrible mother, or a terrible father. I work at a dead end job, uh, and you know it's really it's a tough life. I I just it, I live a boring terrible life. But the Course tells me that all I have to do is read it and work it and change my mind and that that perception will change. I said, okay. So I come back the next year, same place. How's it going? I have a horrific mother. I have a boring job, a terrible job and everything. And it tells me the whole thing. But, all, but the Course tells me that all I have to do is change my mind and I will be healed. Go back the third year. How's it going? I have a boring life, a horrific mother, <laughs> and it sounds a bit like a broken record. So I say to them, I said, is it working for you? Are you starting to feel that peace and love and joy? Or are you following perhaps the ego's misinterpretation of a, a cliché from the Course and you simply are going nowhere fast? Because you're sticking with the same old thoughts, the same old beliefs, the same old concepts, and you're telling yourself this little, cute little cliché that all I have to do is change my mind. And the Course is about changing your mind. But you have to give yourself over to the Course and to the Holy Spirit to have that transformation of consciousness occur. Now what does Jesus really say in the Course? He says that he says, what you do comes from what you think. So even though Jesus is saying, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world, he's given you a little bit of a clue that what you do comes from what you think. Now, do you think that Jesus Christ just tried to live a normal life on earth? No. He was so interested in waking up and knowing his Heavenly Father that he realized that thoughts were very important to get in touch with, and beliefs were very important to get in touch with, and that he knew that he had some kind of great destiny, and that if he followed this inner guidance, and transformed his consciousness, and actually released all these attack thoughts, and all these false beliefs, that he would rise up in awareness, just like the phoenix rising up. He would rise up into a state of mind which we call the Christ mind. And he would transcend the world, and he would say things like, before Abraham was, I am. He would identify with the I am presence. He wasn't saying lead a normal life. I don't think raising the dead, healing the sick, walking on water, are very normal. Actually, I really don't. And I don't think, you know, rising up after you've been crucified and stuck in a sepulcher, I like that word, sepulcher, uh, I don't think being put in a sepulcher and then I, I like it, sepulchre, sepulchre. And then, and then coming out and rising up and going around to teach. I mean, how many people before Jesus were walking around after they were dead? Even Buddha. You know, Buddha was like left a great teaching, but, but Jesus is like walking around talking after he's been a bloody mess. I'm telling a bloody mess with these spikes in the arms and legs. And he's, and he's coming out and he's, he's, rise, he's risen up and he's teaching it. Does that seem normal to you? Do you think he lived a, a Jesus lived a normal life? Heavens, no. And do you think that you will lead a normal life if you follow the Holy Spirit completely like Jesus and hear only one voice, the Holy Spirit? Do you think, can you imagine raising the, the dead, healing the sick, and, and your mom coming by and going, ah, he does it every day. I see <laughs> same old, same old stuff. In this thing. I'm going to listen to I'm going to hear the rock band play tonight. It's just, he's raising the dead again, and it's just so ordinary. But just, you know, it's just not an ordinary thing to raise the dead and to heal the sick. Those are those are great expressions of the miracle of the power of the mind, of mind over matter. Those were tremendous expressions of that. Same with Mary Baker Eddy. Any of you have read the autobiography of Mary Baker Eddy, or for that matter, Yogananda or Ramana Maharshi or whatever. They did not, none of them led normal lives. If you, let's say Ramana Maharshi, for example, 
that is an extraordinary life. Because he's, he's, when he was so devoted to meditation that he just sat and meditated most of his whole life. I mean, when he was young, kids threw rocks at him when he was meditating. He had to move into old temples and into little cracks and caves because, because to get away from kids throwing rocks at him. They wanted to play with him, and he was too big into God to be playing, so they threw rocks at him, like bullies would do, you know. Come and play with us. No. Ah! <laughs> Pelted with rocks. Can you imagine him there? <laughs> I mean, just, you call that normal? I don't think that's a normal life, you know. Mary Baker Eddy, read her autobiography, you know, read about the lady. If you think she le led a normal life, you know, you're, you're in for a big shock. That was not a normal life. The people that followed her, and the symptom removals, and the healings that were all around her, that's not normal. People go to doctors, and, and specialists for healing, only to get more little false little prescriptions and, and little tiny temporary bits of magic that will relieve their discomfort for a little while, then they go pay a lots of money for another one, and another one, and they call that healing. You know, Mary Baker Eddy was into the experience of healing, true healing. And if you read Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, you're going to notice a big a similarity to A Course in Miracles, because the metaphysics are the same. But there's no mind in matter, there's no life, truth, <coughs> substance in, in matter. You know, it's, it's no intelligence in matter, it's just, there is no mind in matter. So, when you start working with the Course, if you find yourself finding a lot of resistance to it, and you think, whoa, this is too threatening, it's asking too much of me, I feel a sense of sacrifice, it's going too far, it's too radical. Well, what the ego will probably do is we'll probably try to say, come along with me and I'll dilute the course. Let's water it down with, with variations of the course that aren't really what the course is really about. In fact, I was talking to Suzanne today and she was, when she heard about Jason and Francis' session, she was so fired up and happy and she said, if people are afraid of this, then they should go buy the book The Secret, or something else that they're not so afraid of. Maybe this is like too frightening, and maybe they'd like to go and get into manifesting. She said, I recommend The Secret. <laughs> Suzanne was actually doing an expression session a couple years ago in the TP out there on the point, and it was a rattlesnake in wow. the expression session, during the expression session. Wow. It was a baby rattlesnake, and it was and everything, and Suzanne was like, calm down, let's look at our thoughts, look at our mind, and people started to jump up, don't do that, she said, don't jump up and move around quickly, that's not the best thing to do, just let it be here, we're going to coexist with the rattlesnake for the entire expression session, and they did, and the rattlesnake calmed down, the mind calmed down, you know, how Jesus stilled the waters, Suzanne was very much, she's lived out here for years, She's seen rattlesnakes before, she had a babel rattlesnake, and she simply just said, let's all stay right here in the teepee, it's over there on the side, and, and it quit rattling, and it just got into the meditation. Mm -hmm. It was there to commune. It, the rattlesnake wants the same thing that you do. <laughs> Actually, truly, the peace of God. That's, that's what its purpose is. That's what Jesus teaches us in the Course. Forgiveness shows us that everything in form shares the same purpose. That's forgiveness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful, striking example of how you could just go forward in peace and calmness and actually teach and demonstrate the principles of A Course in Miracles in an expression session instead of doing all the egoic, panic things that you're supposed to do when you're in a, a teepee with a rattlesnake. <laughs> so, this is what we're talking about. Now, Teach what you would learn, and and not try to molly coddle, you know, course teachers and course facilitators. Well, yeah, that's your opinion. And da, da 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 da. Let's just go. Let's look at what the teachings are. God did not create the world. The world was made as an attack on God, a place where God could enter. Not. You're not going to find that in Advaita Vedanta teachings. The world was made as an attack on God, a place where God can enter not. Let's get real here. Let's get down to the core teachings, because if God, if this is a place where God can enter not, and, and some people will say, 
you know, Jesus didn't mean that. He just had a bad day. Uh, you know, he, he just, just he went off. He's a little off at certain parts of the workbook. And, and people will actually try that with me. They'll say, no, he didn't really mean that. He, he, says, he says later, you know, he says, he says, God is in everything I see. See how he's, he says it right. He's, he's getting sane. He's getting sane there. He's, he's got where was a place made as an attack upon God, a place where God... No, he's saying, no, how many, God, God is in everything I see. I said, well, that's lesson 29. He said, yeah, I know. God is in everything I see. It proves, it proves that God created the world. How can he, how can he be ever, in everything that I see if he didn't even create it? That's, that's a trick. It sounds like Houdini. But I said, well, what's this, what does lesson 30 say? And he said, well, it's, God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. I say, well, don't you see that really the actual, I'll give you the correct interpretation of those lessons 29 and 30, God is in everything I see means the Holy Spirit is in everything I see. Because the Holy Spirit is in my mind. What's the difference between God and the Holy Spirit? Oh, there's a big difference between God and the Holy Spirit. Because God is just pure abstract oneness. And the Holy Spirit has a dual function where he sees the error but he knows that it's not real. He's the bridge back to God. And the Holy Spirit is an eternal creation, but he seems to take on a form of a voice in the mind that can help a lost child come back home to pure oneness and abstraction. So actually those two lessons mean the Holy Spirit is in everything I see because the Holy Spirit is in my mind. What that means is there is a way of looking on this world with the Holy Spirit in your mind where you see the world completely different. That's what Lessons 29 and 30 mean. This, we're not talking about pantheism. Some of you who have studied philosophy know that pantheism teaches that God indwells in objects of this world. You know, when the Course says, God is in that lamp, or God is in that rug, or God is in that window, or he even says, God is in that waste, waste basket. He uses, uses, uses the word waste basket. So what the pantheist of the world would say, cool, God dwells in the wastebasket. No, no. That's not the teaching that God dwells in objects. That's pantheism, and that's the teaching in philosophy, and that has nothing to do with the teachings of A Course in Miracles. But the Holy Spirit's purpose, which is in my mind, is in the waste paper basket, is in that snake, as I just mentioned, because the purpose is given to all the images on the hologram. And therefore, what does that do to the hologram? It unifies the hologram. It shows the hologram as the quantum field, as the unified field. Because why? It has one purpose, which is forgiveness. You see how that works? A purpose in your mind can unify perception. But it doesn't mean that God has anything to do with this world. It means that the Holy Spirit's purpose of forgiveness can take you out of perceiving a false world. I'm giving it to you straight, and you may not hear this in Course in Miracles groups, but I'm telling it to you straight, that this is the teachings of awakening, and there are no variations to this teaching. I'm not saying that one person has the way, I'm saying, I'm not saying I'm a person, I'm saying I'm just giving it to you straight from the Spirit, that these are, if you want to go into this experience and actually experience peace of mind, instead of just an intellectual understanding of the Course, you have to give yourself over to the Holy Spirit and give yourself over to this change of perception so that you see the world completely anew. And therefore, we're not teaching that you can, like there's a saying from the Bible, be in the world but not of it. Has anybody ever heard that quote? Often quoted from the Bible, be in the world but not of it. Well, let's see. If God didn't create the world, and the world was made as an attack on God, a place where God could enter not, and you want to know God, do you think you're going to find God in a world that God didn't create? Or do you think that maybe this is like a smokescreen, a distraction that was made by the ego so that you would never find God? Which one? Finding God in the world, or seeing that it's a smokescreen that was made to cover over the Christ light and take the place of God's love. If you start to realize that it's actually the second, then you will start to really be ready to put your forgiveness lessons in gear 
because all those forgiveness lessons, I am determined to see. I am determined to see things differently. Above all else, I want to see. Above all else, I want to see things differently. What is the seeing that he's talking about? He's not talking about physical seeing, and he's not talking about perceptual seeing at all. Really. He says, the body's eyes were made not to see, and the body's ears were made not to hear. So how am I going to reach God through the body's eyes and the body's ears? I am not. Just like you'll never reach God through words, you will never reach God through the body's eyes and the body's ears. Only for a time will the Holy Spirit use them as symbols, as he's doing with the Course, to open your mind and take you higher and higher into consciousness. But what's the point of going higher in consciousness unless you take the final step that's given by God to the vision of Christ, to seeing beyond the body's eyes, beyond the body's ears? So it actually helped me to go to a hermitage and, and actually to several hermitages, and go into deep meditation, and to have revelatory experiences where the world disappeared. Why is that helpful? Like Jeff was saying, that glimpse. Once you have an experience of the great rays, once you have experience of revelation, then you really have this feeling like, wow, the world is a shadow. It's like Plato's cave analogy. That's a great analogy. Those are just shadows on the wall, on the cave wall. And those shadows have absolutely no reality. To, to follow pantheism, you would say that God is in those shadows. And in the whole Plato's cave analogy, the whole point was there was the fire outside of the cave that was burning bright, and then there was puppeteers, you know, with marionettes that were moving them around, and that's where the shadows were coming from. Those puppeteers and those marionettes are like these false thoughts that we hold in our mind, and they get projected out as these things. They actually look like, looks like a reddish pink cup. This looks like orange juice. This looks like a, an iPad with a purple cover. You know, it actually, th these are just thoughts. Ego thoughts, actually. God didn't create iPads or pink cups or orange juice or whatever. They're egoic thoughts, but they're projected out as if they're images. My thoughts are images I have made. Some of you remember that lesson? It's, he's describing the dynamic as if they've gone out. They've left the mind, and now they have uh, objective reality that's apart from the mind. Like they're physical manifestations. I teach that there is no such thing as manifestation. That's not popular. You don't have a big following. Uh, you know, the secret is much more popular than that. I go to groups and I say, it's absolutely impossible to manifest, and they go, oh, get out of here. We don't want to hear this. This is, this is not exciting. <laughs> I say, well, manifestation can be a helpful step at showing the power of the mind, but, but ultimately, peace of mind is more important than manifesting something that God didn't create. You know, because you want to know God, you want eternal peace, then why would you stay hung up on manifesting things that God didn't create? You know, what's the, what's the joy in that? I manifest this bracelet. I manifest a soulmate. I manifest a new car. I manifest a new house. All right, all right, that's fine. How's your peace of mind meter doing there? Well, it's coming along. It's feeling better than those poverty conditions I was in. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. And then let's, we have to go for, to be, you will believe this course entirely or not at all. That's where we're shifting. We're, we're just saying, we want to know God. We really want to know God in the fullest experience. And we want to know ourselves as God created us. So I'm just giving it to you straight that, that these are the teachings of the deepest aspects of A Course in Miracles. And then you can start to take a look at your mind and you can go, hmm, where am I, where am I trying to dilute the teachings, dilute the truth, make a compromise, uh, have a compromise experience in my mind, and that's good too. Once, you know, if you're fooling yourself, it, it's good to just start to hold up everything in your consciousness to the truth and see if it will stand the light. And I will tell you, if you do that, most of your beliefs about spirituality are going to go too. The big bug zapper will get them too. I believe in reincarnation. <laughs> I... B I believe in that we have a, an ephemeral body. <laughs> I believe that there are spirits in this world. There are spirits in the trees. 
there are spirits in the rocks. <laughs> uh, I, well, I believe that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. <laughs> uh, I, my gosh, <laughs> Wayne Dyer taught me that. Uh, and, you know, it's just going to be like, because take them up to the light. Take all your beliefs in spirituality up to the light and see if they can stand the light. Or see if they disappear. And you're left with just this glowing feeling of love and oneness, you know. That's how we are told in A Course in Miracles to approach God. Bring the illusions to the truth. Don't try to bring the truth, love and light and oneness, into the illusion. When I was growing up, there was a saying, only God can make a tree. I heard that when I was growing up. Only God can make a tree. At some point I was like, hmm, doesn't resonate. Doesn't really resonate. Uh, I remember going through Christianity and I, I was, uh, you know, you have, I don't know. Did you ever have to go through confirmation? Get confirmed in a church or anything? It was, it was a ritual. I had to go through it in my church. Zion United Church of Christ, you have to go, you have to study all these things in the Bible, and, and you gotta, you gotta recite things. Oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and you have to, you have to memorize all this stuff, and you have to say it back to the minister, and then, you have to memorize it too. I mean, it's not enough to just read it off of the paper. I, I couldn't do that though. I, I kept telling my mother and my dad, I said, no, I, I just, there's something I can't memorize, and I just don't wholeheartedly agree with the statement of faith uh, of this denomination, I can't wholeheartedly agree, so I can't, I can't memorize it. And they said, well, you have to memorize it, you know, it's part of the whole thing, you can't get confirmed, and you, how will that look for us, and all of your family and friends, if you fail at this, you know, and black name on the family, and all this stuff, and, well, I just couldn't memorize, I couldn't even force myself to memorize it, so, the minister who was leading the confirmation class, Everybody else was memorizing and spitting it back and regurgitating the whole statement of faith, and I couldn't do it. So finally, uh, I got a phone call, and I was just at the dinner table with my mom and my dad, and I, my mom or dad answered the phone, and they go, it's Pastor it's Hamilton, you know, it's the ministry. It's kind of like in the Matrix, this is your last chance <laughs> of confirmation. And they were giving me a phone call, instead of memorizing and speak and saying it in person, which I couldn't do, I couldn't memorize it. This is your last chance. They didn't say this is your last chance, but that was the feeling like, this is the call. So, I got up off the dinner table, I came over, my mom and dad sat back at the dinner table, and I pulled out a copy of it. You're not supposed to read it. I glared over at my mom and dad at the dinner table, and I read it. <laughs> Because I couldn't memorize it. I absolutely couldn't force myself to memorize those ideas. And I read it. Something about starting off, we believe that God created the heavens and the earth. It was a mistake in there in the first line. And I was supposed to read this, memorize this creed. So then, of course, years later, I was happy to read in The Course in Miracles that, that God did not create a meaningless world, that God did not create the body, that's good to know. I mean, a lot of things that all of a sudden made a lot of sense to me. You know, if God created the body in this world, God must have messed up somewhere. Right? So how did sickness and death and... There must have been some faulty link in there. It's like God must have had a bad day. Or something... There was an opposing influence on the machine. Or there was, a, there was something that must have gone wrong. If, if God created a world where there's sickness, suffering, pain, death, abandonment, rejection, why would God, you know, I've heard other non-dualistic teachings say, well, you know, God, even uh, conversations with God, very popular, it, you know, God was, God needed to create the opposite of God to know that God was God. Oh, come on, <laughs> give me a break, give me a break. God was bored. It was just all this oneness. Just all this oneness. And he thought, come on, a little bit of spice is not going to hurt here. A little bit of variety is not going to hurt. So God decided, I'm going to create a world of multiplicity and variety 
so I'm not bored. Oh, come on. Give me a break. God? God is bored? Talk about anthropomorphism, assigning human characteristics to God. It's like, come on. In a lot of the Bible stories, you know, you know, Cain and Abel, and God is interacting with his brothers, or so-and-so's got to sacrifice such-and-such, and this-and-this. And this. You know, that's why people go nuts when they read the Old Testament. Because it's this anthropomorphic God, for the most part, interacting with these characters. And it's like, would you want to spend eternity with that kind of God? That zaps tribes, that tells people to sacrifice sons, and this and this. It's like, I, I more enjoy the comedians, Bill Maher and, and all these comedians, these YouTube things that poke fun at this dualistic, anthropomorphic God. I have more fun laughing at those things than thinking that those are actually serious stories that you could actually learn from those parables. Better watch out, better not cry, better not pout, I'm telling you why. God is going to zap you if you do. You know, who's going to follow that kind of teaching? It's just not going to get you there. It's, it's just the ego's teaching. It's the ego's religion. It's the ego's spirituality. And we have to call a spade a spade. You know, we're here to forgive that, to release that from our mind. But we don't have to compromise with it and go, well, maybe you're right, or maybe this is my opinion, and let's just agree to disagree. Let's stop it. Let's not agree to disagree. Is that okay? Yes. Can we join in an experience where we all go, aha, uh -huh, claro, they say in South America, claro, claro. Can we, can we not come to that place where we all experience the truth as one, as love? And to do this, the only way to reach it is through clear metaphysics and very deep practice of the tools that have been given you. Jesus says that there are many other forms of the universal curriculum, but he does go on to say that if you are not using this course, you are not using that which has been given to you. And this course is a means of saving time. And that's a good thing. We're trying to bring the Alpha and the Omega together. We're trying to see the world as forgiven and as whole and complete, not trying to keep the duality going. And we're really not interested, interested at all in delay. So, when we talk about these things, we're really into having a direct experience of love in, in the most rapid time possible. That's what we mean by shortening time. We want to come to that experience fully in awareness, in the most shortest time possible. And we're trusting the Holy Spirit to be our guide, trusting Jesus to be our teacher in that. Okay. That's my spiel for the day. Uh, so, we're open to practical questions and what's going on in your, in your groups and different themes. I've heard uh, from some of the facilitators of that, but we're into the practical experience of what I've just talked about. And that's the fastest way, you know, through relationships, through these interactions, through no private thoughts, no people pleasing. We're just pouring everything out on the table in an exposing way.